an emptiness for the preacher to try to furnish like a room, like a house, with a chair and a sofa, heat and light to make it livable. The absence of God is exactly what is not livable. It's the tears that Jesus wept over Lazarus and the sweat he sweated in the garden and the cry he choked down when his own tongue filled his mouth like a gag. The blackness of the preacher's black gown speaks of the anguish of it. The Bible he preaches out of speaks of it. The prophets and the Psalms all speak of the one who is not there when he's most needed. Not to mention Noah and Abraham, Gideon, Barak, Samson, and David, and the rest of them, who, if they did not speak of their anguish, carried it around in their hearts and grew whiskers and wore robes and armor and ephods and stovepipe hats to help conceal it even from themselves because, as the author of Hebrews strips them and all of us bear by putting it, they all died without having received what was promised. And the anguish of that, the anguish of that, of having at most, and by no means every Sunday of the year, glimpsed it only from afar like a light on the horizon that could have been only moonshine. The cross that is a symbol of defeat before it's a symbol of victory speaks also of the absence of God and Jesus speaks of it. He says, seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear. He says, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And on the cross, as far as we're told, no sign was given to him either. Just a sponge soaked in dago red and a word of cold comfort from the good thief who asked to be remembered in his kingly power. Asked him who died without the power to raise spit and looked less like a king than like a street accident. He says, my God, my God, why have you left me? holding the bag, holding the world, when I can hardly any longer hold up my own head. Jesus shares with us the darkness of what it is to be without God, as well as showing forth the glory of what it is to be with God. He speaks about it, and perhaps that's much of why Although we've not followed him very well these past 2,000 years or so, we've never quite been able to stop listening to him. We listen almost in spite of ourselves when he tells us the ship is sinking with all hands aboard. All of you labor. All of you are heavy laden, he says. It's an appalling thing to tell us, and we're trying so hard to pretend that it isn't so, just as it's appalling to tell even the young and beautiful and full of hope that the poor, naked wretches of the world are themselves. But even as we are appalled, we listen. We listen. Because we know that he knows the worst as well as we do. Kilroy has been there before us. The old ones and the young ones, the smart ones and the dumb ones, the lucky and the unlucky, the eggheads and the potheads, the gay libs and the hard hats, they all listen, as they may listen even to the preacher if he will take the chance himself of being embarrassing, appalling us by exposing the nakedness of the poor naked riches and his own nakedness. The world hides God from us, or we hide ourselves from God, or the reason for, for reasons of his own, God hides himself from us. But however you account for it, he's often more conspicuous, God is, by his absence and by his presence. And his absence is much of what we labor under and are heavy laden by. Just as sacramental theology speaks of a doctrine of the real presence, 
Maybe it should speak also of a doctrine of the real absence, because absence can be sacramental too. A door left open, a chamber of the heart kept ready and waiting. I think of another of my extra-canonical scriptures, Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. When the body of Alyosha's beloved father Zosima, the holy man, begins to stink in death, instead of giving off fragrance as the dead body of a saint is supposed to do, and at the very moment where Alyosha sees the world most abandoned by God, he suddenly finds the world so aflame with God that he rushes out of the chapel where the body lies and stinks and kisses the earth as the shaggy face of the world where God, in spite of and in the midst of everything, is. I think of Herman Melville's Moby Dick, where in his sermon in the book of Jonah, Father Matter in Siemens Bethel in New Bedford, Massachusetts, charges all preachers not to shrink from facing for themselves and proclaiming the dark side of truth as Alyosha was forced with a stench of death to face it by saying, which is quote, quoting from Father Mapple's sermon, woe to him whom this world charms from gospel duty. Woe to him who seeks to pour oil upon the waters when God has brewed them into a gale. Woe to him who seeks to please rather than to appall. Woe to him whose good name is more to him than goodness. Woe to him who in this world courts not dishonor. Woe to him who would not be true, even though to be false were salvation. Yea, woe to him who, as the great pilot Paul has it, while preaching to others is himself a castaway. Melville himself as a preacher appalls us by speaking the tragic truth of a dark and storm-tossed world where even the whiteness of the great white whale is ambiguous, standing on the one hand for beauty, for gladness, for holiness, for the priest's white vestments of passion tide, and on the other hand for the whiteness of sharks and snowbound wilderness and death. Not so much a color, he writes, as the visible absence of color, a colorless all color, of atheism from which we shrink. In the beginning, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And as in the beginning, so also now, because there's never a time when darkness and dimness are not upon the face of the deep and upon your faces and mine. What gives such power to the preaching of these artists and what makes them voices that all preachers would do well to learn from is that they're willing to appall and bless us with their tragic word to speak out of the darkness and weep as Jesus wept because maybe only then can the reality of the other word become real to us, the word which to the darkness upon the face of the deep is God said, let there be light, and there was light, which to all those who labor and are heavy laden is, and I will give you rest. They preach the word of human tragedy of a world where people can at best see God only dimly and from afar because it's truth and because it's a word which must be spoken as prelude if the other word is to become sacramental and real too, which is the word that God has overcome the dark world, which is the word of divine comedy. Doug sang as one of his songs about the scene that I think this lecture, as I remember, begins with. The laughter uh, 
that if you look for it, if you listen for it, the Bible of all books rings with. The gospel is comedy. The place to start is with a woman laughing. She's an old woman. And after a lifetime in the desert, her face is cracked and rutted like a six-month drought. She hunches her shoulders around her ears and starts to shake. She squinnies her eyes shut, and her laughter is all china teeth and wheeze and tears running down as she rocks back and forth in the kitchen chair. She's laughing because she's pushing 91 hard and has just been told she's going to have a baby even though it was an angel who told her she can't control herself and her husband can't control himself either. He keeps a straight face a few seconds longer than she does, but he ends by cracking up too. Even the angel is not unaffected. He hides his mouth behind his golden scapular, but you can see it in his eyes. They're larkspur blue and brimming with something of which the laughter of the old woman and her husband is at best only a rough translation. The old woman's name is Sarah of course, and the old man's name is Abraham, and they're laughing at the idea of a baby's being born in the geriatric ward and Medicare's picking up the tab. They're laughing because the angel not only seems to believe it, but seems to expect them to believe it too. They're laughing because with part of themselves they do believe it. They're laughing because with another part of themselves they know it'll take a fool to believe it. They're laughing because laughing is better than crying and maybe not even all that different. They're laughing because if by some crazy chance it should just happen to come true, then they would really have something to laugh about. They're laughing at God and with God, and they're laughing at themselves too, because laughter has that in common with weeping. No matter what the immediate occasion of either your laughter or your tears, the object of both ends up being yourself and your own life. When Jesus wept over dead Lazarus, all sorts of things seemed to have been at work in him. And you can sense many levels to his grief. He wept because his friend was dead and he loved him. Beneath that, he wept because, as Mary and Martha both tactlessly reminded him, if he had only been present, Lazarus needn't have died, and he was not present. Beneath that, he wept, perhaps, because if only God had been present, then, too, Lazarus needn't have died, and God was not present either, apparently, at least not in the way and to the degree that he was needed. Then, beneath even that, it's as if his grief goes so deep that it is for the whole world that Jesus is weeping, and the tragedy of the human condition, which is to live in a world where again and again God is either not present, or at least not in the way and to the degree that man needs him to be present. Jesus sheds his tears, I think, at the visible absence of God in the world, where the good and the bad alike go down to defeat and death. He sheds his tears at the audible silence of God at those moments, especially when a word from him would mean the difference between life and death, or at the deafness of men which prevents their hearing him, the blindness of men which prevents even Jesus himself as a man from seeing him to the extent that the moment of all moments when he needs him most, he cries out his Eloi, Eloi, which is a cry so dark that of the four evangelists, only two of them had the stomach to record it as the last word he spoke, while he still had a human mouth to speak with. Jesus wept. We all weep, because even when man is good, even when he is Jesus, God makes himself scarce for reasons that no theodicy has ever fathomed. And then a strange and unexpected sound is heard. It's like the creaking of a rusty hinge. It's like ice in Vermont starting to crack up in a pond in March. It's like the sound of hens cackling or the old Ford trying to turn over on a winter morning. It's the sound of laughter of an old woman 
and an old man knocking some, themselves out in a tent. It starts out dry and small and ends up so uproarious and big that to preserve his dignity, even the angel has to turn his face aside. Before we ask any questions about the laughter, we should first just listen to it. It starts